I'm Howard Walters with the New Connections Program. Um, it seems to me that a lot of the conversation um, raises sort of this issue that pipeline programs tend to be designed to intervene with um, the underserved or underrepresented individual and to prepare them to, to enter the pipeline. Um, but um, the programs don't, um, as a rule, tend to focus on changing um, the pipe itself and changing the structure. So I wanted to hear some of the panelists talk a, a bit about how um, there's sort of intervention that needs to take place at, at both ends um, around somewhat institutionalizing um, a level of change that creates a more supportive environment that in the absence of a set aside would just be more open and welcoming and um, you know essentially changing the, the context and the environment, somehow intervening at that next level up. So uh the last besides I like to call this medic or the committee on equal opportunity science and engineering. And it was only because there were people from community college or like medic uh uh a broader emphasis within us of um, communicate from that committee to enhance funding and science training among the college. So, several also in that committee, also people who have had experiences with this work of black colleges. And it's only because of people who were on that committee speaking up in the head of um, this alternative pathway into the profession through. Uh, program to black colleges that have So let me answer your question. Answer questions that the successful graduates of pipeline programs have obligation and have a responsibility. And that is to change the pipeline. So I'm, I'm acknowledging the fact that this is the dominant path, like the dominant method. I'm acknowledging the fact that, you know, regardless of what I say destroy, it's unlikely that there's going to be a dramatic shift from others to change the black man. So the responsibility rests on our shoulders, those of us who benefit from those black men, to um, bend it, to mend it, to adjust it, to provide the opportunities that uh, will enhance alternative pathways. Let me, let me second that. I think um, our push for really establishing and creating a, a network of, of these different groups working together is one attempt to try to do that. I think because of the funding issues, because of the inconsistencies, I think if you do that both with a volunteer approach and a paid approach, meaning that you're going to have staff in these programs. But many of like for ESIN, we continue because we volunteer. We continue because we're committed to serving in that role for each other and the next generation. We continue to do that because one, I'm a tenured faculty member. I sit in on all the tenure decisions when I'm a part of that process. I have an input that might bring about a different perspective, and I've seen that. I sit on peer reviews, I'm a standing committee member for CSR. I have input, and that changes the dynamics. So my goal is, and our change strategies, get those that are in your supply line already out and prepared. You know, if others want to do more to increase the supply, I'm saying the group that can have, do very well with them. And that's what our focus is at this point. And part of the obligation of being a part of ESIN is that you have to begin to accept whether or not you were trained that way, the idea that you have to be able to make way for others, it has to be a part, you have to be taught that. Not some people come out of graduate school in that way. And I think that's the way we try to address that. So that the system's changed a little bit from within, and the type of questions that we have to ask, and the type of questions that we have to ask. And if I question, you're, you're asking essentially how do you change the profession in some way to make it more open? Uh, or, or, or looking at, um, real quick in a um, nutshell, the New Connection Program, for example, was founded um, out of the idea that um, the foundation historically had not been um, giving grants to um, certain segments of, you know, you know, types of scholars. So they created a program to diversify their own um, grant making. Um, it was the initial intent behind the New Connection Program. So it was that they were intervening on themselves and their, their own grant making process. So I'm thinking about um, within um, the realm of you know, public policy and economics, um, et cetera, um, how there could be a look at, well, how can we begin to you know, hire more faculty, not necessarily as a, as a pipeline program, but just as who we are, like sort of changing your identity. Okay. Like it's not, a, it's right. not an extra effort, it's just beginning to intervene so that 
it's not an extra thing. It's the thing. Yeah. Well, to, to do that, <laughs> you, you need you do need more diverse groups of people who participate in the profession. And one of the things that uh, in the summer program, undergraduate <coughs> program, uh, for uh, uh, a while we actually had uh, programs split to bring in students who had a heavy mathematical background as well as some students who didn't have such a heavy mathematical You know, whenever I'm asked by undergraduates, you know, how should I prepare for a PhD in economics? Basically, my answer to them is that, you know, you kind of need to be an applied math major. Right? Um, so a bunch of math classes you have to take. Well, that's the ideal background. And if we had everybody who came in through the uh, undergraduate summer program like that, then we produce more of the same people. But you, it, it's also helpful, I think, as economists to have a broad social science background, to know something about history and lots of other social science areas. Well, if you do that, you can know all the history that you want, but that's not going to get you through econometrics or game theory. <laughs> I mean, so there's this other technical side, and we try to do both. The problem is we're bringing in students maybe who are very bright and who are broadly uh, trained as, as undergraduates. Uh, and, and also students with a heavy technical background is you need funding. Right? And we did this for a while, but after a while that funding went away. Uh, because to, to go back, connect with an earlier question, with the funding and these programs is the institutions sometimes back these programs. Uh, even though a pipeline program may be great for the profession, sometimes the institutions make really straightforward cost benefit decisions. So what do we get out of this you know, for us? And it's sometimes quite expensive for the institutions invest in these programs, and even though they may help the profession, the institution may say, well, we, we're not getting enough out of this, or we've done enough. The institutions may make the same decision that, that the foundation is making. In fact, one of the most interesting conversations I ever had about <coughs> mentoring uh, was around what I thought was the most, one of the most successful mentoring efforts of all time was at you know, MIT. And all of the black faculty and community <coughs> there, particularly the black you know, when, when Sam was there and Sandy there, and even a group of other people. And I said, well, why, why did this stop? Why did it come to an end? Well, these students were working very hard, and, and they were suffering. I said, well, aren't you supposed to suffer as a graduate?